Hello, and uh, welcome to today's lecture on confounds and experimental control. In our previous lecture on research methods in psychology, we talked about experimental designs and the logic and uh, nature of experiments. Today, I want to spend a few minutes talking about different ways in which <clears throat> experiments can um, go awry, so to speak. And this is when we have what we call a confound. So what we're going to do today is talk about, introduce what a confound is, though we've done that in previous lectures, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then talk about some participant-related confounds, some experimental-related confounds, some procedure and design confounds, and then finally, I'll round out with a couple of suggestions about how to deal with some of these issues um, and prevent having difficulties. So let's start with what a confound is. Confounds are any extraneous variables in any study. So this is something that we haven't accounted for. So in a correlational design, we might have an extraneous variable that is explaining the relationship between two correlated variables. In an experimental context, we're talking about extraneous variables that are competing with our independent variable for explaining our dependent variable. Recall that in an experiment, the logic is that any change in our dependent variable must be due to our independent variable, provided that everything else stays the same. So all things being equal, if the only difference is our change in our independent variable, that is our manipulation, then any change we see in our dependent variable must be then due to our independent variable. And confounds compete for that explanatory power. That is, it's possible that the confound is causing a change or masking a change in our dependent variable as associated with our independent variable. So we want to make sure we're accounting for all possible confounds. <coughs> Pardon me. So that gets us to some different types of confounds. I want to start with participant-related compound confounds. I almost said compounds. Um, there are several different ways in which participants can uh, be associated with confounding variables. We'll start with what we call experiment-wide participant bias. This usually happens because we've selected um, a narrow range of participants, and as a result, we have an overall bias sample. We'll then talk about systematic bias, where some sort of participant-related variable has varied systematically along with our independent variable. And then finally, we'll talk about how participants react to an experimental situation and what we call reactivity. So we'll start with this experimental-wide bias. One of the biggest problems psychologists have is we most often have undergraduate students as our participants. They are oftentimes required to participate in experiments as part of their coursework. And as a result, we end up with thousands of studies with thousands of undergraduate students. But the problem is those students aren't like everyone else. So these participants automatically, systematically differ from the general population because they're undergraduate students. They're not just regular people, people who aren't students, people who are working um, perhaps even the same age, but not in college and working instead. Um, certainly, they're in the 18 to 21, 22, 23 year old range. So we don't have later 20s, early 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. We have a very narrow range of participants. These are also participants who spend their days in lectures, taking notes, theoretically, taking exams. And so any study where we might be interested in things like their note taking. So if we were interested in what would happen if we allowed jurors to take notes in a trial, and if we only use undergraduate students, then we're using people who are um, very different in that particular skill than the rest of the population. So we have a problem system-wide in or experiment-wide in these kinds of studies because we have such a narrow range of participants. And we have to consider whether or not this is valid outside of the undergraduate student population. Additionally, we have a big problem sort of system-wide as psychologists in that most psychological research is conducted in Western, educated, industrialized, uh, rich, and democratic countries, what we call weird. And in fact, you can see in a number of instances how those participants are different from the rest of the world. So for example, the Mueller-Liar illusion uh, is a classic illusion 
that we talk about in psychology, but actually only occurs or primarily occurs in weird countries. That is these Western educated industrialized, rich and democratic countries. That particular illusion occurs there more than it does in other countries. And so we have to be very careful about where our participants are coming from and the conclusions we can make based on that. So the next question we have is about systematic bias. And systematic bias occurs when any participant variables that might vary systematically with their independent variable. Uh, and these can be quite problematic. So if we have a between subjects design and we allow some sort of participant systematic bias to occur, then we um, have a serious problem because now instead of our independent variable being responsible for our data, what we have is a problem in which it's possible that that systematic difference between groups might be a problem. So our first solution to this is to randomly assign people to conditions so that we don't have any systematic bias across um, any levels of our independent variable. But fate being what it is and randomness being what it is, sometimes we will have systematic bias anyway, despite having done random assignment. In an extensive nationwide study called the Women's Health Initiative, uh, individuals were, women were randomly assigned to different conditions to receive placebo, estrogen-only replacement therapy, and estrogen and progestin hormone replacement therapy. The problem was is that there were systematic differences between those groups, primarily ones involving uh, levels of education. And despite the fact that everyone was randomly assigned, those biases simply occurred by random chance. And so as a result, the second solution is to match samples. So what the investigators then would do is after conducting, conducting their initial analysis, they would conduct a secondary analysis where they match their groups based on things like education, etc. You can also use uh, analysis of covariance or other statistics to account for these differences. So there are ways around it. The first thing you have to do is you have to have the information to begin with. And so one of the things we'll talk about here in a moment is how we can uh, make sure that we are collecting as much information as possible. So our final participant related confound is called reactivity. And reactivity occurs when participants modify their behavior in response to the fact that they're participating in an experiment or they know they're being observed. Participants react differently based on the fact that they are in a study. So, or they know that they're being watched. So it's not naturalistic behavior. And that's really important for us to understand because oftentimes participants will modify their behavior um, to be more socially acceptable, to fit with our research hypotheses, etc. And we're going to talk about that in our next section when we talk about demand characteristics. <clears throat> so that gets us to experimental related confounds. The first experimental related confound I want to talk about is experimental bias. And this is not people doing uh, nefarious things and intentionally biasing their research. It's their own biases about the outcome that are altering their behavior in ways that they may not be aware of. So this is the phenomenon in which the outcome of an experiment tends to be biased towards the result expected by the experimenter. It's our inability as humans to remain completely objective that's the ultimate source of bias. And so particularly when we're talking about small labs where everyone knows what the point of the research study is, and they know what the hypothesis of the research study is. Um, in these instances, we can have a potential source of serious bias because people might behave differently based on what they think is supposed to happen in a research study. So this can be seen in a variety of ways. We can get biased measurement. And in fact, there's some classic studies involving how fast people are leaving or how fast people are walking after they leave a research study. And in the earliest versions of this, uh, experimenters were timing the participants as they were leaving. And it turns out, unconsciously, they were altering the way in which they timed those individuals such that there was bias in the data. And so oftentimes what we have to do is remove the experimenter from the, the equation. The best way to do this is to do computerized testing where the computer 
randomly selects people to be in conditions. The experimenter has no idea what condition they might be in. And the experimenter's job is basically to get informed consent, answer any questions, and then just let the experiment happen uh, without, with as minimal participation of the experimenter. Now, of course, this isn't always possible. If we're talking about clinical measurements that require measuring heart rate or blood pressure, respiration, dealing with the participant quite a bit because there's a number of different um, tasks involved. But the best way to do this is to try to limit this bias as much as possible. Of course, the other way we do this is by using blind experimenters in which the experimenters know nothing about the experiment or they don't know what condition a person is in, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next um, experimental related confound is what we call a demand characteristic. And the demand characteristics are really best um, described by talking about the case of Clever Hans. Clever Hans is a horse who could do math. Well, horse couldn't really do math, but they thought it could do math. And this is actually a picture of Clever Hans. And so uh, he was quite the phenomenon. Um, went around showing people his math skills. And what he would do is he would, he would basically paw out, paw out, or stomp out the um, answer to math problems. Well, it turns out, if once somebody started systematically investigating Hans's abilities, if Hans could not see any people, in particular his trainer, he could no longer do math. Hans was not doing math. Hans was watching the people around him for clues as to when he was arriving at the correct answer. People didn't know they were doing this, but they were leaning forward, changing their stance, some sort of nonverbal cue was occurring in which the individuals were providing information to Hans about when he had arrived at the right answer. Hans was very clever, but he was essentially very clever at observing people, but not at doing math. This is what happens with a demand characteristic. This is when cues are given to participants about how to behave in an experiment. And again, this can be happening at an unconscious level where people are encouraged to try harder or to do things differently, or the investigator gives some kind of unconscious body cues about the experiment. All of these are potential possibilities um, that we want to try to limit. There are a number of different ways in which we can see these kind of demand characteristics and the way that participants respond. So first we have the good subject role. This is where subjects try to corroborate what the experimenter expects. So they're essentially trying to be a good subject so they want to verify your hypothesis. We don't want that. We want the truth. We want to make sure that we're actually getting at what's actually happening, not getting subjects to do what we think they should. The opposite of that is the negativistic subject role, where they attempt to refute the hypothesis. Uh, in some of my own personal research, we were interested in the memorial effects of nicotine withdrawal. And a number of participants refused to believe that there was any effect on their memory by quitting smoking cigarettes. And so when they came in not smoking, they might try to attempt to refute the hypothesis. Unfortunately, their memory was so bad, they couldn't really do anything about it. Uh, and so that negativistic subject role didn't really matter in those cases, but it's something to keep in mind. The faithful subject role is people that just come, follow instructions, don't try to figure anything out, and they just try to make things, um, try to be a good subject. Finally, we have the apprehensive subject role. Here we get subjects trying to respond in ways that make them look better, more socially desirable. This is particularly problematic when we're talking about social psychology research or sexology research in which we're asking fairly personal questions. Oftentimes people will answer in a way that they think they're supposed to rather than being honest. And all of these things can happen because of cues that are given by the experimenter in terms of how they're supposed to respond. So finally, we want to talk a little bit about some procedure and design confounds. We're going to run through these just relatively quickly and kind of list them out and talk about how we uh, accomplish or deal with these. Environmental variables are the first. Uh, some questions about timing and then finally stimuli and materials. And we'll get into stimuli and materials in more detail when we start talking about in particular within subjects designs. So environmental variables is our first 
um, procedure and design confound to look at. These are things like noise, unexpected noise, particularly if we are running a number of different conditions in an experiment. If one day there's construction in the building and there's loud noise going on, we want to make sure we take note of that. And that's one of the most important things we'll talk about here is that we have to think about rec accurate record keeping and making sure we're recording anything unusual that might happen during an experimental session and that might include something like noise. Lighting, do we want to make sure, particularly if we're doing anything involving visual perception, that the lighting is consistent all the way through the experiment and we focus clearly on the amount of lighting, etc. So um, you can't go about giving perception studies, visual perception studies in particular, under different lighting conditions because those can dramatically alter um, the responses you might be getting. Temperature, if it's too hot, too cold, heat's gone out, it's a super hot summer day and the lab's stuffy and hot, these can all affect uh, performance of participants. Smells, you know, maybe people down the hall are doing something weird, maybe it's the end of the semester and you've had um, herds of people coming in and out of the lab and it just smells like, I don't know, teenagers, uh, which is never a good smell. So you want to record these things, try to be mindful of them, and make sure that we try to keep things as consistent as possible throughout the experiment. So we want to try to minimize these to the greatest extent possible. The problem is, of course, we can't control everything. Timing variables. This is, there are a number of ways in which the timing of your data collection can become important. Let's start with uh, time of day. Uh, we always try to test participants always at about the same time of day or within a narrow range, uh, usually between 10 and 4. Um, but we always want to try to make sure we're mindful of that. And in particular, if we have participants coming back more than once, so in my smoking studies and a variety of different studies, we've had people come back uh, twice, usually at least a week apart. We always schedule those at the exact same time of day so that we can eliminate time of day as a potential a confound between those two study sessions. Uh, and the reason this is important is that there are certainly circadian rhythm uh, effects of things like mood and cognition. And so if we're talking about something like aging, that's why I have here particularly if we're studying aging, older adults have better cognitive performance in the morning. So 8 o'clock in the morning, they're going to do very well. They're going to do very poorly in the afternoon. Whereas your average 19-year-old is going to do poorly at 8 o'clock in the morning, but do pretty well in the afternoon. So we have to be mindful of it and probably even systematic in our studies uh, of that. Time of the semester. Are we testing people early on or later on in the semester? Are there people who are doing their research credits at the beginning of the semester more motivated than those at the end of the semester? These are important questions. So if you're doing a between subjects design, you want to be running both conditions at the same time throughout the semester. Important thing to keep in mind. Finally, uh, one of the things I encourage people to do is lots of record keeping, ask lots of questions. There's no such thing as too much data because one of the things we have found is uh, on occasion we will have um, reviewers ask for menstrual cycle data because cognition, mood, etc., can vary across menstrual cycle. So if we're trying to make inferences about gender or sex differences or um, cognitive differences across two different time periods in the same group of people, we're going to need to know menstrual cycle data because that can become very important in terms of trying to track those kind of differences. All of this comes down to record keeping, record keeping, record keeping. Get as much data as you can and uh, pay attention. Finally, stimulating materials. There is a lot of art in the, the science of putting together an experiment. One of the things we want to watch for are things like item type and difficulty. So if we're doing, say, a between subjects design, let's say we're going to have people study items in the morning and test them, and then we're going to do the same thing in the afternoon. So we're interested in circadian rhythm. One of the things we're going to have to do is make sure that half of the participants get one set of items in the morning, while the other half of participants will get those same items in the afternoon, and vice versa. It's called counterbalancing. So that if some items are more difficult or harder to remember, we've counterbalanced them across morning and afternoon so we can eliminate that as a potential effect. 
Similarly, we can get practice effects and fatigue effects and carryover effects. All of these have to do with the order in which we might be presenting material. Participants oftentimes will get better at a task. So in some of my drug studies, we test people under both placebo and uh, under the influence of a drug. One of the things that we do is we counterbalance the order in which they get placebo, placebo and drug because they might be getting better at a task because they've now done it twice. That would be a practice effect. Well, we want to make sure that they didn't get better because of a practice effect and not because of, say, uh, a hormone supplement we've given them. Similarly, we can get carryover effects. In some of my midazolam studies, we got carryovers from people who got the drug first, then the placebo trial second. There were some carryover effects into that placebo trial because their memories were so bad in the drug trial. And then fatigue effects uh, occur when people are just tired of being in the lab. So if we have people doing five or six different tasks, we're going to counterbalance the order of those so that the um, same tasks aren't always coming first or always coming last because that can affect their um, results. So we solve this with what we call counterbalancing. So we're going to counterbalance the order. And in a f uh, later uh, lectures, uh, we're going to talk about counterbalancing, particularly in within subjects designs. All right. So last bit of advice, collect as much information as you can about participants, height, weight, gender, sex, um, age, what they had for breakfast. I mean, try to be as controlled as you can uh, as possible because you never know what might be important. Uh, and so try to collect as much information as possible. Document everything. So document day, time, temperature, unusual circumstances, etc. And then finally, you just want to carefully plan and organize everything before you even get started. So everything's counterbalanced. You have people assigned to conditions before they even arrive so that nothing is uh, potentially biased. All right. Well, that is your introduction to confounds and experimental control. We'll be looking at different types of research designs in our next uh, lectures.